Hi, this is Dr. Vallesh. Welcome to Pharmacology Simplified. In this video, I'm going to speak about organophosphorus poisoning. This is a very important topic and it is important for your theory exams, practical exams, viva, entrance exams, everywhere. It's a very important topic. So what all are OP compounds? So OP compounds are cholinesterase inhibitors. Cholinesterase inhibitors actually belong to two major groups. The reversible cholinesterase inhibitors and irreversible cholinesterase inhibitors. All the reversible cholinesterase inhibitors are used in the management of various conditions. But the irreversible cholinesterase inhibitors are lethal drugs. They are designed to kill. So all irreversible cholinesterase inhibitors are insecticides, pesticides. There are two subtypes of irreversible cholinesterase inhibitors, organophosphates and carbamates. When we say OP compound poisoning, we mean both of these. Okay, OP compound poisoning will include both organophosphates and carbamates. So these are irreversible cholinesterase inhibitors. So inhibition of cholinesterase enzyme will result in accumulation of acetylcholine because cholinesterase enzyme is required for breakdown of acetylcholine. So if this enzyme is inhibited, there is accumulation of acetylcholine. So where does this accumulate? This accumulates in and around cholinergic receptors which are the two types of cholinergic receptors, muscarinic and nicotinic. So whenever there is OP compound poisoning, there is accumulation of acetylcholine in the uh, uh, surrounding muscarinic and nicotinic receptors. This will lead to manifestations. Now all the manifestations of OP compound poisoning are similar to parasympathetic activation. So what are all the manifestations, what are, what are all the symptoms of uh, OP poisoning? So we can divide them into uh, muscarinic symptoms and nicotinic symptoms. If you remember, there are three types of muscarinic receptors, M1, M2, M3. So M1 receptors are located in the CNS, M2 in the heart, M3 is located uh, around glands and smooth muscles. So let us look at uh, the muscarinic symptoms receptor-wise. M1, the CNS, there will be excitation, irritability, disorientation, ataxia, convulsions, coma. M2 receptors, so remember M2 receptor whenever it is activated by acetylcholine, there is inhibition. Same thing is seen with OP poisoning as well. So whenever M2 receptors are activated, there is bradycardia, fall in BP, bradyarrhythmias. M3 receptors are located in many places. In the eye, M3 receptors activation will lead to meiosis. So even in OP poisoning, M3 receptor activation will lead to meiosis, which is manifested as pinpoint pupil. PPP stands for pinpoint pupil. In addition to that, there is irritation of the eye because of the uh, toxic nature of the compound, blurring of vision. Lacrimation uh, is because of uh, action of uh, M3 receptors on the glands, lacrimal glands. So all the glands, glandular secretions are increased. So there is lacrimation. And not only that, there is also salivation. There is increased sweating, copious tracheobronchial secretions. The respiratory system, parasympathetic activation will lead to bronchoconstriction. So likewise in OP poisoning, the manifestations are similar. There is bronchospasm, it leads to wheezing. There is also this copious tracheobronchial secretions which will contribute to respiratory difficulty. Uh, frequently death due to OP poisoning is because of respiratory failure. The GIT, parasympathetic system is involved in rest and digest type of response. So uh, normally parasympathetic system activation will lead to increase in intestinal movements. So even in OP uh, 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 poisoning, there is increase in GIT movements leading to cramps, abdominal cramps, diarrhea, vomiting. Urinary system, there is uh, increased uh, uh, urine outflow because of uh, due to normal parasympathetic system activation. So even in OP poisoning, there is involuntary urination. So all these are muscarinic symptoms. Next, moving on to nicotinic symptoms, there are two types of nicotinic receptors, NM in the neuromuscular junction and NN in various uh, ganglionic sites. So uh, activation of NM receptors in the skeletal muscles will lead to muscle fasciculation, twitching and weakness. So this is another manifestation during OP poisoning. And adrenergic synapses, NN receptors in the adrenergic synapses are activated and as a result there is sympathetic outflow, increased sympathetic outflow. The major manifestation of this is seen in cardiovascular system that will lead to hypertension and tachycardia. So look at this uh, uh, contrasting uh, uh, manifestations here. Direct action of OP poison, uh, uh, I mean uh, direct action on M2 receptors will lead to fall in BP bradycardia. Whereas indirect action will lead to hypertension and tachycardia. The net result can be either of these. It can be either hypotension or hypertension. 
can be either tachycardia or bradycardia, either tachyarrhythmias or bradyarrhythmias. So, CVS manifestation uh, following OP uh, uh, compound poisoning, uh, it, is, it is not specific, it can be either. Moving on, how to treat OP uh, compound poisoning? So, before that, let us see the general principles of treatment of poisoning. There are four general major principles in the treatment of poisoning. Remember this, this is important for you from your exam viewpoint. You can write this as a common uh, answer for any poisoning. There are four major principles. First one is to stabilize the patient, maintain the vitals, ABCs. Whereas ABC actually stands for A for airway patency, inspecting the airway and removal of any obstruction. B for breathing, give oxygen through mask or prongs. C for circulation, you establish an IV line and give IV fluids as per requirement. This is the um, um, uh, most important thing. You have to stabilize the patient first. Everything else comes later on. Second uh, principle is to terminate further exposure to the poison. Once this is done, you should focus your attention to administer any antidote if available. Not all poisonings will have uh, antidote. A specific antidote is available. You administer that as a third step. And finally, you provide symptomatic and supportive management. So these are the four general principles for the treatment of poisoning. So let us apply these principles in the management of OP poisoning. The first symptom, will, first uh, principle will remain the same, maintain vitals, ABCs. Second principle, termination of further exposure to the poison. Remember, all the OP poisoning, uh, OP compounds are insecticides, pesticides. They are designed so that they enter the skin of the insects very easily. So if these compounds can enter the skin of the insects easily, they can very easily enter the skin of the humans. So if you are involved in the management of any OP poisoning patients, please be very careful, take adequate precautions so that you do not come in contact with the vomitus or the urine or any of the patient secretions. Because if at all it, uh, it contains any of the OP compound, there is a risk that it will enter your own body. So take adequate precautions, wear gloves, wear uh, protective uh, equipments. Okay. And how do you terminate a further exposure to the poison? You expose the patient to the fresh air, remove the cloth contaminated with the vomitus. Remember, if the patient has consumed it, consumed the poison, in the vomitus, the unabsorbed portion of the uh, poison will still be there. So you need to remove the clothing contaminated with vomitus, wash the skin mucous membrane with soap water, and gastric lavage should be done if the poison has been ingested recently. Next, the third step is providing specific antidote. There are two specific antidotes for OP poisoning. So, which are these two specific antidotes? Atropine and oxymes. So between these two, atropine is a life-saving drug in the management of OP poisoning. Okay. So, atropine is an anti-muscarinic agent. OP poisoning will have both muscarinic and nicotinic symptoms. Atropine counteracts only muscarinic symptoms. So, how does atropine act? It is a it's an anti-muscarinic agent. You block acetylcholine action on the muscarinic receptors. So how do you administer it? You administer it through IV 2 mg repeated every 10 minutes till signs of atropinization appear. So remember these are signs of atropinization. You can only observe them. These are not symptoms. These are signs of atropinization. What are all these signs of atropinization? Pupil which was pinpoint gradually starts uh, becoming Mitriatic. So, pupil is no longer pinpoint. Reduction of tracheobronchial secretion. So, on auscultation, the uh, chest uh, auscultation will be more clear. Clear chest on auscultation. And finally, tachycardia can be considered a sign of atropinization. But if the patient previously had tachycardia at the time of presentation, this is not that much useful. Okay, that is the reason why you please write this at the end. Do not write this in the beginning. So this is about atropine. Atropine is a life-saving drug in the management of OP poisoning. Even though it contra contracts only muscarinic symptoms, this is a life-saving drug. Second antidote is pralidoxime and other oxymes. Pralidoxime contracts both muscarinic and nicotinic symptoms because the mechanism of action of pralidoxime is it reactivates the cholinesterase enzyme that was inhibited by the OP compounds. So uh, OP compounds uh, the cholinesterase enzyme will have two uh, sites, anionic site and esteritic site. For pralidoxime to go and reactivate the cholinesterase enzyme, it is mandatory that the anionic site should be free. If anionic site is free, only then pralidoxime will go and sit 
only then it will reactivate the cholinesterase enzyme okay it binds the anionic site of the acetyl cholinesterase and regenerates the estratic site that is a mechanism action of pralidoxine so between op compounds and carbamates when op compounds are administered op compounds only block the estratic site they will leave the anionic site free on the other hand when carbamates are ingested carbamates occupy both estratic and anionic site so that is the reason why you should not give pralidoxine if the patient has consumed a carbamate there is another reason for that pralidoxine itself has weak inhibitory action on acetylcholinesterase enzyme so that is the reason why in carbamate poisoning if you give pralidoxine it will not regenerate the cholinesterase enzyme but it itself will worsen the condition by inhibiting acetylcholinesterase enzyme so because of these two reasons pralidoxime and other oximes are absolutely contraindicated in carbamate poisoning remember this so how do you administer pralidoxime you should give a loading dose of 30 mg per kg through iv and a maintenance dose of 10 mg per kg continuous iv infusion until recovery every hour you have to give 10 mg per kg now remember pralidoxime works best if you administer it as early as possible if you delay the administration of pralidoxime the benefit will go the reason for that is the, con the concept called aging what happens is when you give op when when uh, uh, the cholinesterase enzyme is attacked by op compounds the cholinesterase enzyme will become phosphorylated so it becomes phosphorylated cholinesterase enzyme the recovery of this phosphorylated choli phosphorylated cholinesterase enzyme it normally takes many days by this time the cholinesterase enzyme will gradually start losing its power so ultimately when the, the phosphorylated enzyme uh, becomes regular enzyme by this time the cholinesterase enzyme would have already lost its power so this is called as aging so if you delay the administration of pralidoxime whatever work it does that is also useless because by this time the enzyme itself would have lost its activity so you have to give pralidoxime as early as possible if you give pralidoxime after a delayed duration of time and by that time if aging of the enzyme has already happened then entire administration of pralidoxime will be useless so remember this very important concept so apart from pralidoxime pralidoxime does not cross the blood brain barrier apart from pralidoxime there are two other oximes obidoxime and diastyl monoxime out of these diastyl monoxime crosses the blood brain barrier so this is uh, frequently asked in the entrance exam please remember diastyl monoxime can cross blood brain barrier so this is the third point the last point is symptomatic and supportive management this depends on the patient and the manifestation of the patients so you can give diazepam for controlling seizure you can give antibiotics to treat any infection uh, if present or if suspected and frequently the patient might uh, end up in shock so you treat it uh, appropriately by giving fluids or any other manifest uh, or any other uh, intervention so all this symptomatic and supportive management depends on the patient and the symptoms so i hope i have uh, uh, simplified this topic for you thank you namaste have a nice day